All right, well, hi everyone. Welcome to this week's speaker chat. I'm Bianca Woods with the E-Learning Guild. Oh, the Learning Guild, we dropped the E. That's right. <laughs> Still getting used to it. Um, and I'm so happy to have you all here today. We've got Carla, our fantastic guest, to talk about all things micro-learning. And uh, just so you know, here's how it's gonna play out. Um, we've got some questions, Carla, and I have talked about to kind of kick off the conversation, but if you have any questions related to Carly's recording recorded session, if you happen to watch it, stuff that we end up talking about, uh, stuff, just general questions you've been wondering about microlearning, pop them in the chat. That's where we're going to be looking for uh, audience questions. And, you know, we're going to be trying to get as many of those audience questions done as possible. So Carla, tell us all a little bit about yourself. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I, already I see a few names and faces that, I, that are familiar. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, my name is Carla Torgerson. I am the Director of Instructional Design at Bull City Learning. We do custom learning materials, particularly e-learning, but also ILT and of course right now VILT for our clients. Um, and I have been in the instructional design space for about 15 years. I've been on the consulting side. This is my third firm now. So I've been on the consulting side for a long time, but I've also been on the inside of two large organizations in the past. And I always love to share that because I understand the, the pressures and the politics of being on the inside of a large organization, but also um, understand the, the, the beauty and the joy of, and pressures, of course, of being in a firm where you're trying to push the envelope and do unique things for clients, stuff like that, which is what I do now. Um, and I am also the author of two books about micro learning. Um, I did the micro learning guide to micro learning about four years ago. And, and, thank and you I happen to have a copy I, at I my desk. I don't have it handy, <laughs> but, but she does. Look at that. How handy is that? Thank you. Um, and we just uh, published a new one with ATD Press that came out um, in December called um, Designing Microlearning. And, um, and honestly, if, you know, I can't, I can't love one of my babies more than the other, I suppose, but, but I do like the second one because it's just, it's more contemporary. It's filled with more new thinking and um, guidance and, and stuff like I'm that. I'm telling the book over here you said that. <laughs> yeah, right. Love you as <laughs> much as her tell. new baby. Don't tell. <laughs> All right, so let's get started with some of the questions that you and I talked about. Sure. Um, so one thing when I was reviewing the recording is early in the session, you talked about, um, you asked the audience for what their definition of micro learning was. And there was a lot of really good answers, but very, very different. And I'm thinking yeah. probably a lot of us have heard different definitions of micro learning in the past. So kind of wanting to get your thoughts on what you think has led to the definition for, I mean, what's a really popular concept of being so foggy. And like, I think it really matters for us to have a super precise definition or is it sort of a, a vaguer amorphous one okay? Yeah, it's, it's a great question you ask, uh, Bianca. And it's interesting because I, um, I was involved in a conversation on Twitter um, hmm. just like a week or two ago about this, which is interesting because I'm not on Twitter all that often, but this one <laughs> was really interesting. Um, and um, some other folks like Clark Quinn chimed in and stuff like that. Um, and I think where I land personally is that, first of all, that definition is incredibly muddy, as you said, and, it, and I believe it is muddy because we're all excited to do something new or unique or different. And micro learning comes in many flavors. So we all say we're going micro, but, but that means different things to different mm -hmm. people. Right. Um, and, and actually, um, in just a moment, I'll share a slide because I've got a, a piece that I think will help clear that for people. Um, but what's interesting to me about, to your point, do we need to be clear and precise? I will say that personally, I believe that that, that gives us clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me personally, I, you know, I, I don't um, want to fall on the sword of, you know, is this performance support or is it just in time training or is it boost learning or, or something like that. But, and I don't want to get too muddled in those details. But yeah. what I do want is that if I'm talking to you, Bianca, or anybody else on this call, right, and I say, hey, I've got this new idea for a program that I think is going to work really, really well. 
that if I say I'm doing micro learning, that we all know what we're talking about. And we know if I'm suggesting a boost learning solution or if I'm doing some sort of pre-work for some other learning event or something like that. And so to me, that clarity allows us better communication and better expectations with each other. Yeah, so maybe if you're working with someone new, I mean, open with that wording and it sounds like you're saying, and then also double check to make sure the person get is getting the meaning you intended. Yeah, right. And, and to that point, you know, it's interesting because um, um, there's always a great debate for micro learning about what is the appropriate seat time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because in a lot of ways, a lot of, well, a lot of people will say it's quote, just enough, right? And, and I believe that too, right? It should be just enough to get the learner what they need. Um, and, and I know a lot of thought leaders stop there and, and, um, and it's sort of, that's the answer, right? It's just enough. And I know my co-author on, on the new book, Sue Iannone, and I, we talked about this so many times, like, like seriously, like entire meals were consumed over this topic, <laughs> right? Um, and, and what we landed on was that same thing about setting expectations and setting clarity, right? And so to, to give some sort of a, an idea of approximate seat time actually kind of matters. Because if I'm talking to you, right, or, or Josh is here, I know Josh, so I'm going to call him out for a second. There. <laughs> like if I'm talking to Josh, right, and I'm like, hey, Josh, got this great idea and we're going to do this micro learning program. And Josh thinks that every piece is going to be 30 minutes and I think every piece is going to be six that's a really big disconnect. It's huge. Right? Um, and, and similarly, like maybe Josh has drank the micro micro Kool-Aid and he thinks all micro learning should be two minutes or less. And I think it's going to be 10. We still have a pretty big disconnect. So, um, so to me, giving some sort of a sense of seat time is important. But yeah. again, you know, I've had people say to me, hey, I did this piece, it's 12 minutes, it's over that 10 minute mark, is it still micro learning? And I, I don't like to play that game. I, I think if it's just enough for the learner and it's approximately what we all agreed to, then fantastic. Yeah. Um, so with that, Bianca, would it be okay? I Like we talked about when we were in the green room just before we got started, I do have this one slide that I yeah. think might be helpful for folks. We're all about the screen sharing. We have tested the screen sharing. It's ready. <laughs> we did test the screen sharing, didn't we? So let me just get that going here. Um, and I promised everybody and myself that this would not be a presentation. This is a conversation. But these couple slides might be helpful. So just give me one second. So there we go. Bianca, are you seeing my four uses of micro learning in the center of the screen? I there? totally am. Awesome, awesome. So what, what Sue and I have come to, to talk about a lot in, in our book, um, and, and for me, this has been something I've been working on for a long time, is really that when people talk about micro learning, they really talk about doing one of four different things. And this is where that clarity can come in. So, and I'll show you the four things, and then I've got actually um, a common word or name that you usually hear, and then we'll talk about seat time. So the first yeah. one, is, there we go, is preparation. So using micro learning to prepare for longer form instruction, like a class or even an e-learning. The second one is some sort of a follow up to again, a longer form instruction. The third one is standalone. So staying just not associated with a class at all, but kind of on its own, usually an e-learning or a short video or something and then support, right? Giving people help on the job. And again, these names are things you've heard. So in preparation, we call that pre-work, right? And, and you can go micro in your pre-work. For follow-up, often people talk about boost learning. In standalone, I've never had a good name for it, so I've always called it short form learning. And then we've got performance support, right? And so to me, it's really important that we are talking about, we know which one of those we're talking about. And then to me, the whole seat time thing becomes clear, because watch yeah. this. So, so we know that with informal learning, people tend to watch things that are about four or five minutes or less. 
Now, you, now certainly with formal learning, it switches up. But with that in mind, we know, for me, um, based on a lot of research that I've read about, you know, what users tend to gravitate towards, I would say make your pre-work maybe up to about 10 minutes or less. Your boost learning, on the other hand, should be super short. The, the uh, research from Art Cohen says that they actually did tests where they gave boosts, which were 30 seconds, and other boosts that were up to, I think, it was five minutes. And what they found was the ones that were three seconds or even five seconds were equally effective. Because with boost learning, all you're doing is trying to remind um, and do recall work, right? So it should be super short. And then with standalone, if, like I said, informal learning, so that's the stuff where they get to choose or not, four minutes is your sweet spot. The research is very clear. It's the same thing like if you're watching crazy cat videos on Facebook or <laughs> YouTube or uh, videos that, uh, on, on LinkedIn, you'll tend to gravitate towards things that are about four minutes or less. Now, if unless it's you're me, in which I'll be like an hour long video on this cat, sure. An hour long, right? Yeah, right. Um, but then formal learning, what's interesting is I do believe that if you're telling somebody that this is required learning and we're going to cover these things for your, that you need for your job, that first of all, we can go longer. And my experience is I usually have to. There's mm -hmm. more depth that needs to be covered. And then the performance support, it's sometimes like at a glance, which is your 15 seconds, or it can be just in time training, usually around five, five minutes there. So that to me, um, I, like I said to you, I wanted to share that because a lot of people have told me they find this helps and adds a lot of clarity to that whole definition versus seat time and stuff like that. Yeah, and um, I've got a question, uh, the research reference. Yeah. Was that mentioned in your original talk? Like if we point people back to the recording, did you have like the, the specific details about where the research came from? I do not know if I did because I can't remember for sure. Fair enough. It was a while ago. Well, well, we're seeing all the wrong screens coming up here. Let me just turn that off. There, there we go. Let's stop share. There we go. Um, so let, let me just to toss it in the slide, in, in the chat here. It's art. Seriously, my phone's going to start ringing right now. <laughs> Wait, it's, we're day, having a Bianca, fun a day. It's Friday, Carla. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you guys no. all got to see my, my uh, team's messages and my phone's ringing. Like, like, you must be thinking I am not doing well here at home. But, but well, it's Josh all right. says <laughs> it totally wasn't him. So that's the important part. Um, so yeah, I threw it in the chat. It's Art Cohn. Um, he wrote a couple articles, two or three or four um, for Learning Solutions Magazine, two of them in particular that I have taken a lot of guidance from um, about micro learning. So, and he calls it boost learning because he's specifically focused on that one little piece. Yeah, and for those of you who are asking about the slides, um, the part that she just shared right now is actually in the um, session recording that we referenced. If you hadn't had a chance to take a look at that, it's fantastic. And um, it's in the twist post that you might have gotten the uh, link to register for this in. It also would have come in your confirmation email, so you can uh, get that. And Mark, if you can grab the twist post and pop it in the chat when you have a chance. Mark Britz is my coworker and he is doing the awesome event producing today. So a big thanks to Mark. And thank you, Kristen, for adding the um, Learning Solutions Mag link for thank us you, as well. Fantastic, thank you so much. So, I mean, that, that slide you just walked us through, it feels like that could be a really useful way to shape the conversation. If you say micro learning and you're talking to someone new and they're like, yes, micro learning, you could then go, okay. And in this case, I'm thinking short burst standalone learning. And you could kind of start broad with the term micro learning. And then that, those are some good terms to use to go a little more narrow and make sure you're all on the same page. Yeah. And, and again, to me, it's more about having clear expectations between me and, you know, my stakeholders and my internal team. Yeah right? It's not about being like, okay, guys, this is going to be four minutes because it's informal learning and it's just, right? It comes out. <laughs> and how dare it be 401? <laughs> what was that? 
And how dare it be 401 minutes? Seriously, right? Yeah. Exactly. So so to me, it's not about being really too particular and too specific. Yeah. Um, Because we get ourselves tangled up as an industry, I think sometimes with, you know, being, falling too too tight on those definitions, but I think it helps us to have clear expectations as well. Yeah. You know, there is a question you and I talked about speaking of clear expectations. I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but this was, I thought this was a great question because we've, and we had a conversation about this on Twitter a while back where someone was asking what the difference was between performance support and micro learning, if there's a difference. Yeah, it's what are a, your thoughts. Oh, it's a great question. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm taking a moment to think. Um, so to me, performance support is a type of micro learning. Um, it is not, of course, as you saw in that circle diagram, to me, it's not the only type. But for me, the idea of micro learning is also very exciting because it enables us to think more about performance support. It's not an afterthought. It's something that we're thinking about as we're designing the broad solution. Um, so that said, to me, performance support is a type of micro learning if it's relatively short, right? So if it's a job aid, I would say, hey, if, the, if they're able to use it and, and use it to improve performance in a short amount of time, Perfect. Just in time training, performance support, job aid, all of that I consider to be a type of micro learning. Now I have had people say, and I've heard the argument often that performance support is not learning and therefore it's not micro learning. Um, and, and I will just say that for me personally, I just don't buy into that because I'm really about improving performance and there are so many things you guys heard this guy ringing already today, right? So there are so many times that I just look it up on my phone and do I remember it again later? Maybe not, but was my performance improved? It sure was. So if, if we're really focusing on being performance improvement people and not just the training people, then to me, the distinction doesn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, ideally we're playing in both spaces. Right, right. So, so to me, you know, even if you can't say it's firm learning and it's more support or if it's reference materials, those still become really viable things for improving the yeah. performance. All right. Well, if anyone has any questions, be sure to throw them in the chat. I'm going to keep going with our questions. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked about what micro learning is. We've talked about it that generally speaking, it's short with different shortnesses, depending on what we're trying to do. How do you get your content short and still have it be meaningful to someone? Yeah, so so it's a great question. You know, I think that's where the the you know the um, it, it gets so tricky, right? And and it, you kind of have to really be thinking about what the learner needs mm -hmm. and what they might find useful. Because I've done ones where you know. Um, we, we were trying to get it to a certain length and realized that, you know, even though short, we thought we'd go short, they needed more. Um, and that's okay. So I think if, if I recall correctly, your question was really about like, how do we get short enough, but still provide value? Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so to me, it's real. I really think about the user and the user experience. That's where I start is if I was the learner and I was the target audience, what would I most want and most need? And so I really need to think about what their, what would their need is at that moment or you know what they might be interested in at that moment. So for me, yes, I'm talking about taking it down to one learning objective, right? That's your, your goal with micro learning is one learning objective. But then how deep do you go into that objective should depend really on the use case and the user's experience. Yeah, and I believe someone mentioned the one objective in the chat earlier. That is a really easy thing to use as your North Star. Do I have mm -hmm. one one learning objective here or do I have more than one? Do I have more than one? It's not short enough. <laughs> right, right. Ah, thanks, Nancy. So, um, we talked about how do you get your content short. And I think a lot of the times people in our roles, in the learning development roles, tend to be, generally speaking, 
I'm going to be helpful here, very focused on who we're designing for. But sometimes we're going to work with partners who, not out of maliciousness, but that's not their, necessarily their go-to. Mm -hmm. And so for them, they'll come, maybe come to you and go, I'm really keen on bringing some micro learning in, and they might get really hung up on the number, like how, how many minutes it is, length, rather than it meeting the goal. I mean, you had this great quote in your presentation originally that was from Diane Elkins, a five minute training that doesn't accomplish its goal is a waste of five minutes. I think our industry tends to be pretty good about keeping that in mind, but our partners, not always as much. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've had that happen with you or can just guesstimate how this will play out. What do you think are some good ways to steer a person away from that in a supportive way that doesn't dampen their excitement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting um, because I think, um, like you said, especially subject matter experts sometimes get really excited about their content and then they believe oh, yeah. people need everything. Um, and I think, again, for me, it usually comes back to um, really thinking about the, the learner's experience. And somebody put something in the chat, um, uh, Kevin, thank you for that about, you know, really focusing on the learner's experience being essential to the learning itself, right? And, and I think that's where I would go to, right? Mm. I would ask the subject matter expert, okay, like, think about that person who's doing the blah, 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 you know, I'd, I'd paint the picture of my audience. And I say, now, do they really need that? Would that be helpful to them? Um, and usually it helps back my SMEs down. Um, not always, right? It's not always easy. Um, we also, try our best. I, what was that? And we try our best. Right. I will say that, that um, actually I'm thinking of a project I'm on right now, and it's not specific to a micro learning project, but in all learning, it's typical that people, you know, want to tell more than they really should. Um, and it's been really, I have found in a few key projects of late, that if I've got more than one SME on the phone at the same time, they often will help me because one of them will like, yeah, yeah, Jim, we didn't need all of that. And because they also have that subject matter expertise, they help. Right. And then, you know, a little later in the same conversation, Sally will be like, yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah. We, we need that, but, but we don't need this. And, you know, and you know, this so means I, keep each other honest. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes they do, you know, we all have a shared vision of doing yeah you know, something that's concise and helpful to people. And then they help keep each other honest as much as I do. Yeah. So that can be helpful as well. But yeah, I think to your question for me, it's usually about focusing on the learner experience because then it's not so much about my opinion because my opinion against a SME's opinion is just one against one. And yeah. honestly, they know the stuff better than I do. So so it's not, it's not a position I want to be in. I want to be in a place where I'm saying, hey, this is our goal, this is our vision. Do you really think that's gonna do that? Because for me, it doesn't feel like it will. And how, you know, can you help me to-, um, to try? Yeah, so it's less about your expertise versus their expertise and more about let's all put the, the audience at the center and go, does this, yes. does this feel right? Yes, 100%, 100%. So we've got some really awesome questions in the chat that I wanna jump over to. Uh, first, Joy Goldberg asked, if you're doing a needs assessment to determine if micro learning would be a solution, what types of questions could you ask? Because folks seem to always default to a course, kind of that long form. Ah. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, I, think, I think it really is about understanding the way it's going to be used and the use case. So, um, so for example, um, I was on a project actually once, it wasn't that well, it was a while ago, but not super long ago, where we originally thought we were going to need to do uh, a series of courses. We thought we'd do three or so e-learning modules. Mm -hmm. And when we asked about the user experience and what we really thought the learner was going to do with these pieces, we realized that they really didn't have 30 minutes or an hour to sit at a computer at one time. And that in this case, and I think it helped to keep us a little bit more honest as well, it was completely optional. So, you know, there was going to be some reward if you completed all of the learning, but there was no requirement from your boss, for example, to, to do it. And so then we really had to hone in on the learner's experience and like, okay, 
they're most likely to have between five and 10 minutes in between calls. And this is how it's going to work. And, and we got to a solution, which was a micro solution because of that. And, and, you know, I always hate telling too many <laughs> micro stories. Cause I like, I fear that people will be like, Oh, she's a one trick pony. She only ever builds micro learning. And in fact, I don't, when I start a project, I am looking for what's the best solution to the learning need, right? And sometimes that's a, a, an ILT program, instructor-led training. Sometimes it's an e-learning program or, you know, a single e-learning module. Sometimes it's micros, you know, it, it's kind of all over the place. And so I think really thinking about what the learner's experience will be, that would be the first advice I have. Now, the other thing to think about is just the depth of that content. You know, because mm. I've done lots of courses where I thought, wow, we've got a lot to share here. Uh, you know, if, if we're going to teach you all about whatever concept, that's going to take us 30 to 60 minutes. Sounds like, it, or, or maybe 20 minutes. I, I hate out. I, I do not build hour long e-learnings anymore. And I don't think very many people do anymore. Um, but, but just like recognizing how long that needs to be for that, to cover that concept. And if that's the appropriate way to do it because sometimes learning requires focus. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, I do not spend all my days building micro learning solutions. In fact, right now, when we were in the green room, I was talking about the project that's got my attention the most right now. And we're building um, an, a VILT virtual instructor led training uh, program for, for a sales meeting, which is going to last um, multiple sessions over four days. Um, but you know, there's other times when micro will make sense. And with this one, we actually did create some pretty serious reference materials so that we didn't have to tell them so much, but they'd have performance support. Yeah, so I've got a question from Nancy. She asked, is it possible to take a, a longer curriculum and break it down into micro learning experiences? Yeah, it's a great question, Nancy. Um, I think that you can, but you need to be careful. Like, yeah. um, because, you know, sometimes people will take, you know, the hour long course and just chop it into six. Oh, we see that minutes. so often, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and I have always been of the ilk that that's if, if you still had to watch all 60 minutes to get the entirety of the learning you needed, then that probably wasn't that helpful. Um, but you know, I've had people push on me and say, yeah, but our, our agents only have five minutes at a time so they can do that and they can in six days or, you know, we give them in six minute pieces and in a week they've covered all of it. And I say, well, great, fantastic. You've thought about their experience again. Right. Um, but to me, if, if it's going to be standalone learning, it should stand on its own. I shouldn't mm -hmm. have to watch all six pieces or participate in all six pieces to get the full learning experience that I need. Um, so then I think when you look at, at a curriculum, if it's really clear that some people need certain pieces and other people do not, or it'll be really easy to give them chunks over time, then fantastic. That's when I would think about micro. And, yeah, I think and it seems like it's that, not- like, Is that the answer to Nancy's question or did I go in a wrong direction? I think so, but it also seems like, you know, people talk about micro or this and it seems like Micro and mm. is another good option. You do mm -hmm. some parts of your curriculum go micro and some of it not yeah. so much, just whatever is appropriate. Well, and that's why I like that that model that I showed at the mm -hmm. beginning because it, it helps us to remember that micro isn't the only thing too, right? Because you can even use micro to support longer form training or you just have the longer form training, right? Like it doesn't always have to go micro. Um, and then the performance support can support longer form training, or it can stand on its own as well. Um, it, um, you don't have to have training prior to performance support. Yeah. So Kristen asked, do you think it's worth making micro learning adaptive or does micro learning tend to be so short that it doesn't matter much to have it be adaptive? Yeah, I saw that come in the chat and I wanted to ask, I think it was a Kristen, was it? It was Kristen. Yeah. So Kristen, if you can get ready to type, cause here's my question for you. By adaptive, do you mean um, like adaptive, um, uh, responsive to the screen and the device, or do you mean adaptive in terms of if I'm doing really well, I start getting a different path than somebody else? I'm curious if you if you mean responsive. The second or... one says Kristen, so it adapts yeah. to what you're doing. So, um, to me, 
Uh, it, it's a great question. I, and, you know, and I've seen people talk about adaptive solutions that use micro learning because if you look at platforms like say Exonify, which is definitely an adaptive learning platform, I'll type that in the chat. And this, I, I don't, obviously I don't work for them, um, but I like what they've been doing. Um, what they do is theirs is a question engine. And when somebody logs into their computer at the start of their shift, um, they um, get a question or two. And based on those questions, they get a little feedback and then they go on with their day. And so they're getting little bits of learning pushed out to them. And then the next day when they log in, a couple of days later, um, they get a different experience, right? They get different questions and stuff like that. And, and again, um, there's others, there's um, QStream, there are, oh, sorry, my chat just went to private. Sorry, hold on, hold on. So there's Exonify, there's QStream, there's a lot of others that are jumping into that space as well. So from that perspective, that micro learning makes sense to be adaptive. Um, but in general, if we're not using some sort of tool that helps us create adaptive, then I think for me, I would like, so Kristen, you know, I, I haven't tried to develop something where it was adaptive. I would have just provided the entire menu and let the people choose what they wanted and thereby they're sort of creating an adaptiveness for themselves. Um, if that makes sense. And Bianca, you know, we talked about queuing up an example. This might be a good spot where I could sure. do that if you want. Okay. Um, so, so I'll just screen share again and I'll show um, kind of to Kristen's point about adaptiveness of what we did with this project. This is that one I talked about before where we thought we would probably build a couple of e-learning courses. And mm -hmm. in the end, we ended up building a micro learning program um, and so to, to the earlier question, I think it was Nancy asked about, you know, how do you take something and break it apart? Let, let me show you what we did with this one. Um, let me just pull this up nice and big and then I'll screen share it. Um, so are you seeing that now? Yep. Awesome. So what we did with this one was we looked through the content and just kind of, you know, if, if you can imagine in the past, you know, Sections two, three, and four would have been the e-learning courses, right? And five was probably your assessment or something. Um, but what we did was every one of these little bullets that you see here actually was its own little piece, its own little micro module. So what we did was within an area, we figured out what the smallest pieces were, each of the specific tools you might want to use, and we provided them. And then what we did was we also and made the structure on the LMS unlocked. So um, what we did was, if you wanted to enter the discovery section, you did have to um, watch this one video called Introduction to Discovery. But then after that, these all became open and you could choose to take any of them in any order that you wanted. And they were standalone. You did not know where to, like, and, and show me it didn't never said as you learned in fly on the wall right it was very discreet and so we were able to then create this experience which to Kristen's question became a, a sort of adaptive because people could take what they wanted and we actually thought there would be a decent amount of people who would jump over to number five try it out <laughs> and if they found that they did okay or not they would see which parts they might want to look at more in depth afterwards um, so, so that's kind of a, a little bit of a, you know, maybe a shady answer to that because it's absolutely <laughs> not adaptive at all, but I was letting the learner self-select. Yeah, no. I mean, the, there's a clarification there in the chat. Sorry, go ahead, Bianca. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a nice grouping of questions that we need to get to because, man, everyone, you've got great questions. We're going to try and get to as many of, the, of them as we can. If we can't get all the questions, I'll probably loop in with Carla and see if she can write some quick little answers to any we don't get a chance to hit. Uh, but we've got some time. Um, I have a question from um, Ebba. She, um, they ask, how do you see the relation between micro learning and OER? And I'm guessing by OER, it's open educational resources. Um, and that's if there's a relation. I think that's usually a little bit more in the academic space if I'm correct? 
Yeah, it's been a while since I've been in, in, in higher ed circles. Can you give us a little bit of more information about OER? I'm not familiar with that term. Um, so OER, are they're freely accessible, um, like open license media, module. text, uh, digital assets that if you're a teacher, you're allowed to use for free. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't been a classroom teacher in the past. Being able to use things for free are nice. Mm -hmm. um, have, you, have you seen anything kind of playing in that space of micro learning? And, you know, whether it's OER or um, any other kind of licensing that makes things available for free? Yeah, I think it really depends on who you're following, right? Because I think there's lots of uh, people who create content for free. Right. Um, and, and within the corporate training space, the same holds true. Yeah. Right? So, for example, um, at my company, I do s some videos we've been trying to do every two weeks on LinkedIn. But with, with being at home, it's, it's a little less. But um, about every two weeks, we do a video and they're usually in that micro length. Right. Um, but we also throw up blogs and, and other articles on our website that people can can use. So to me, but now I guess what we're really talking about is like classroom resources that you could use for teaching. Um, so it's a good question I haven't really thought of, but I would assume that if they are short and they get to the point and they teach someone something, that that would be effective learning. And if they're short, they kind of fit in that same realm. Um, yeah, it might not be easy to search out OER or like Creative Commons and the word micro learning, but I bet if you just searched for the thing you were in need of, you'd bump into things that maybe weren't labeled micro learning, but totally were. But they're short, right? Yeah, and yeah. I, think, I think that's the interesting thing to your point, to what you're saying, actually, Bianca, is really making me think about how um, I think we've all been going to shorter form. We just suddenly like, kaboom, <laughs> we've got this term for it now. But um you know, please in the chat, don't like, don't gasp too loud. But when I first started four years, 15 years ago, we were doing e-learning modules that were like four hours long. No, no, right? Like pretend you didn't hear that. Right? I, you know what? I bet a bunch of the people in the room right now have been in that spot. I mean, I, I was doing compliance training in my, like I think my second instructional design job. And yeah, we were playing in that it's, about around that length of training that you're gonna do, gonna do it over like the course of two weeks. It was yeah, yeah, and you'd mm -hmm. log into Elmer's, you could take the <laughs> yeah. pieces you wanted in and out, and and you know, and then we used to start talking about mini e-learning modules, and now we call it micro learning. But I think this has been an evolution over yeah. time. But um, unless um, you're Kevin or whoever is under no, no, no. <laughs> because Kevin mentioned still in that situation and the other speaker is my org has 36 hour e-learning mods. Wow. That gives me the heebie jeebies actually. <laughs> so, but thank you. You guys are making me feel better because I was a little <laughs> afraid I'd be the only one and everyone would be like, oh, oh no. Four hours. But yeah, you know, I think we've just gradually gotten to this place that we've learned and realized that shorter is probably better and allowing people the flexibility to come and go makes sense. Yeah, and easier if you're an organization where you're thinking about worker hours um, yeah. or employee hours, the cost, like I used to calculate the cost of how much it costs the organization for each piece of um, mm -hmm. compliance training we put out because everyone had to take it. And yeah. like 50,000 employees times their average pay for you know four hours it's, it's an easy way to sell the micro mi micro learning if it, it legitimately is a better solution for your problem. Yes. <laughs> Dollars. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. So, oh, well, th this question ties in really nicely to what I just said, because I was talking about compliance training. Tammy asks, how do you design micro learning when compliance is required to read long pieces of policy? Oh. C can you? <laughs> Maybe so, you can. so, so yeah, I, I have a couple of thoughts about micro and compliance. So Tammy, mm -hmm. you know, what you said um, really kind of holds dear to my heart because I think on one hand, I've always felt that compliance training could easily be shortened, right? So you've got, and not shortened, but maybe you're just breaking it apart, right? And so like, 
I, I worked in, in a, actually the two organizations I was in were both highly regulated. One was the financial services and the other was healthcare. Um, and when I think about like we did one hour, we had requirements for an hour of compliance safety training once a year, right? In, in the hospital. And I had often said, I was like, what if we just did five minutes once a month and that's an hour. Yeah. And we've met our obligations to, to the regulators. Um, where I w got a lot of pushback on that was actually that, um, that tracking and making sure that everybody did it for compliance purposes was, was going to be too challenging with our large organization. So I think those are real opportunities to keep those compliance topics top of mind and show our learners that we actually care about their time because like nobody wants to take an hour of compliance e-learning. No. Um, and from a memory perspective, I have to imagine breaking it apart more works right. better. Spacing and repetition. Yeah. It's, it's the foundation is one of the foundations that micro learning sits on. Right. And so if you did another little bit every month, we would expect that you would perform better as well. Um, so, so yeah, so to me, that's, that's one of the things, but then the other side of it, which I think is what's being mentioned in the chat there is about um, like, what do you do when there's regulators that say it has to be a certain amount of time? So, yeah. Or so the, I think in yeah, this case, ahead. the, you, there is actual probably legal sections of, blocks of text that have to be read as existing in order to meet the legal requirement is what I'm guessing from this question, which right. that's frustrating. Right, right. And I apologize that that is where we were going. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, so it's a good question because I really hate to make people read policy because then, you know, like, I, I get why we do it, but it's more of about a compliance issue than teaching them to be safe on the floor or. Yeah. Maybe or, you micro around the policy that if you legally have to do the policy, make them read the policy you do and it sucks, but you, then you yeah. micro around it with, okay, so here's what this means. Yeah. Right. And, and that's where I would think is like, put that document in the references or it's a link that you just read. And like you said, sign and accept or whatever. But then you're, it, the micro is either, this is what it means, or let's think about a couple of the most challenging situations you might face. How might you do it? Yeah. Um, but yeah. So Kevin asked a question that kind of relates to some stuff we were talking about earlier. We were talking about how do you, you get someone away from the, who's really hooked on the micro learning equals, you know, it has to be under this amount. What, do you, what happens when you have the opposite pro problem where you're looking at a situation and you're like, I feel like micro learning could fit in in some way here, but the clients or your partners are, they're always coming from that place. And I, I think all of us have felt this, this pain before where they're like, I need blank hours of training. They, they come to you and they're not like, this is what I want to solve. They come to you and say, I need five hours on leadership. Mm -hmm. If someone's in that headspace, how do you nudge them in the direction of micro might actually be the direction they want to go? Yeah, I think, you know, in that, in that example, you know, the person coming and saying, I need five hours of training. What that has told me is they have done, for better or worse, they've done their needs analysis already, right? And so what I would try to do is dive in with my own needs analysis questions and try to see if, A, maybe I would agree with them once I understood the problem the same way they did. Or quite possibly also, you know, <laughs> the flip is that I can start asking some good questions to say, you know, is that really what they need? What's the performance you're trying to get? What, what are, how are you trying to improve this? So that, you know, and, and so to me that that's really more of a needs analysis thing and just asking really good consultative questions. Yeah. I, and that, if your client isn't someone who's in a learning space, they might not even know to start from that position and it's not them trying to be jerks. It's all they know about training is really length. Yeah. And well, so it's and just what, reshaping their thoughts. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, I was working on a uh, project, actually it's, it's the one I'm working on right now where, um, where we're doing a lot of uh, VILT. And what I found mm -hmm. was that our, our client who, and who's also the SME who also doesn't really have a learning background. We really had to back her into the learning objectives by saying, okay, so, 
so like how much do you want wh what do you want to say and how long do you think that will take you to say it and in some ways it was completely backwards and um you know i, I kind of felt like maybe my instructional design certifications should be removed from me oh, because no. I was like, <laughs> you know i was like well we're not starting with the learning objectives but she couldn't think of those she, all she could think about was what she needed to tell and how long she thought it would take her. And that's how I got to what was the depth, what was necessary, and then I could write a learning objective based on that. And, um, and I think sometimes for people who don't have a learning background, that's just how they think about it. Absolutely. And like, we all can't be experts at everything. So it, it's right. not something we should blame them for. Right. So we've got a question here. Um, in the education space, but I think we can broaden it out too. So um, the question was, do you have any trouble getting continuing education units for micro learning? Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, this idea of formally tracking micro learning for the purpose of either potentially tracking for um, education credits, um, recertification credits, or even just the organization knowing what you've covered um, you know, it, it's a question that comes up. How, how do we mar measure micro learning? Should we? Can we? What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Bianca, that you ask that. Um, I think it really depends, obviously, on what you're trying to do, right? So um, in a lot of cases, what you see is micro learning in the past anyway, has been used in, as informal learning. And I think that's where everybody got so excited about it, right? They saw these great videos on YouTube and they can fix their faucet at home and, you know, or the stuff they saw on LinkedIn and they're like, wow, I can learn a lot in a short amount of time, right? But those are all informal learning experiences where you're also highly motivated because you've got a faucet you want to fix or, or whatever, right? Um, so with those tracking, that isn't really important because the learner is so motivated to take it. Um, but the flip is oftentimes in corporate training, we're teaching people stuff that maybe they don't see the need for, or they didn't, wouldn't take if they didn't have to, or, you know, there, there's all kinds of um, things that go on there. And so then obviously we need to track it. Um, and so that point about giving CEUs, I, it, it gets really dicey. I've seen places that do stuff like that, where they'll say, you know, as long as you complete six of these 10 pieces, we know that they're each about five minutes each and we're gonna give you credit for 30 minutes of training. Um, I think where it gets dicey is um, nobody wants to track five minutes of a CEU because CEUs usually mean something meteor like an hour or, you know, a ten or more. So that's where I think it gets dicey. And so usually people are looking kind of packaging up multiple micros to be able to be worth any sort of a credit. Yeah, that, I, that packaging sounds like a, a good way to take smaller snippets and then put it into a way that a lot of our continuing education credit organizations are looking for, because they're not looking for 60 to five minute slots. They're looking for hours of content, not minutes. Right. But yeah, that's a, that's a great idea and, and a good way to find a happy medium between keeping it small, but keeping it in a trackable length that makes sense to whatever organization is doing your certification. Yeah, and and you know, to your point, I, I actually did know of an organization a, a couple of years ago that was using Exonify. I mentioned them before, right? Um, and they were doing um, you know two to three questions a couple of times a week, which was training, right? They were giving yeah. about five minutes each session, two or three times a week, and they were actually talking to their lawyers their legal team to see if they could use that in place of the one hour of compliance that was required once a year. Yeah, I, I think some of it is just, you know, getting some of these organizations and some of these legal requirements to see that these smaller bits of learning all add up to the same thing as what they're used to uh, an hour long class yep. on, just reframing their headspace. Yep. And there's a great question comment in the chat there from Eba about open badges, yeah. right? And a lot of people do do that with, with micro learning, right? If you take so many pieces, you earn a badge or, you know, you're, you're, you're working towards some sort of uh, badging by taking a certain number of pieces. So that also works well. Um, thank you, Eva, for that. That was really helpful. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking about things like degreed too, where there are yeah. 
services out there that allow you to track a bunch of of things that probably in many cases would be considered in the micro learning space and keep it all in one place as basically your transcript of here's all the things I did. Yeah. Well, and the cool thing with Degreed also, and I'm glad you brought them up. I can't yeah. believe I didn't. Um, but um, the, one of the cool things they do is like this little point system and based on sort of the length and complexity of the piece you consume, you get more or less points. Ooh. Right. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if they turn that on for all, all, all instances, but I've seen that in use. Um, so what's really cool is you've got kind of this score, and if you read a Wall Street Journal article, you get like so many little parts of a point, and if you t if you consume something that's much more complicated or, you know, Harvard Business Review, um, then it's, you're going to get more points if it's lengthier or more complicated. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty neat feature. I did not know that, so that's pretty cool. So I think we got a lot of the, the chat questions. We've got about nine minutes left. Um, I know you had some other examples you were thinking you might want to share. So this is probably a good point to segue over to that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so here, let me just share my screen. Give me just a moment. I'm going to get that set up. So here we go. All right, so, yeah, okay, here we go. So you're probably seeing that screen that I showed before with the, the different map, right? Yep. Yep. So the pieces I'm going to show are actually two pieces from this program. And so, like I said, this one, we thought we would build a couple of e-learning modules. And when we really thought about the use case, it became clear that doing smaller pieces of content made more sense. So I will tell you that the um, topic for this was teaching sales reps how to sell using a particular methodology called sell by design. And so again, we could have done the, you know, the discovery module, but what we realized was when we looked at it, there really was, okay, you need to set up an introduction, help, help people have the cognitive map, but then there was actually these six different tools that you could use for discovery. Um, and then insight, there was a couple as well, acceleration, the same sort of approach. So we were able to break it into pieces. And so with this, we used a mix of videos for some of them, and some of them were um, more traditional e-learnings. So I'm going to show really quickly just one minute of one of the videos first. And Bianca, you should be seeing my video screen now. Absolutely. Right? Cool. So this one is the introduction to acceleration. So this is the piece that you would watch to get just a little bit of cognitive um, understanding of what the acceleration concept was about. Uh, as you can see here in the lower right, it's two minutes and 21 seconds, but I also know that you're not here to learn about acceleration um, and the sales concept. So I'm gonna play uh, about a minute just so you can see it, see how it's done. And then we'll, we'll pause and talk about it for a second. So here we go. So you've done some amazing discovery and you've engaged your customer with insights that are newsworthy and revealing. They're excited to work with you on a solution or even several. So what happens next? Well, you could do option A, which is craft the perfect PowerPoint that captures your solution, perhaps even convene a pitch team and carefully rehearse who will cover what, maybe even create a demo or you could do option B, which is do none of that and instead co-create the solution with your customer. Best answer, B. Why? A is just too risky for several reasons. In the first place, A assumes you'll come to the customer with a solution. All right, so I'm gonna pause there. You've seen about, about a minute here. My point is that there was a lot of energy and creating a lot of um, with them, the what's in it for me and motivation and setting a bit of a cognitive structure for what they would be learning in the rest of the module. And, and again, they were all optional so they could choose after they'd seen this if they thought they needed any of those pieces or not. Um, so I'm just going to stop the share and um, see if there's any questions or comments about that. Otherwise, I'd be happy to sh quickly show in a minute or so in e-learning as well. Yeah, let's let's jump to that. We got five minutes. So yep. okay. All right. Last little preview. Last little piece. There we go. Okay, so you should be seeing um, 
a browser window it says fly in the wall. Yep. So you can see here that on the lower right, it says it's page one of 10. This was a storyline piece and it is seven minutes. So let's do this. A little bit of an intro. Fly in the wall is a tool that can maximize the information you get with the least amount of effort. So let's start with a quick question. What do you do when you're in your customer's lobby waiting for your customer to greet you? And so you can see we've got an interactive question here, trying to try to keep this in interactive, right? Um, and let's see, let, let me get it wrong. Everyone else does that too. And we get some feedback. Right. And then what we've got next is we've actually got a little bit of an whether you're hanging out in a lobby or observing your customers in action, there is value to be found. I know an account executive who sold IT services for the healthcare sector. One day while he was waiting in a hospital lobby for a meeting with the IT director. All right. So in this particular case, it was a little bit of a voiceover to animation that told a story to explain the concept and then um, of course, curiosity is a, we have a couple other pieces. Again, we tried to layer in questions and interactions along the way. You saw that um, two slides ago. Um, with these ones, what I found was interesting and kind of challenging was that as much as we wanted these e-learnings to be really highly interactive, they didn't, you know, the goal was to teach them this new concept of sharing so uh, or of selling and so we did do some upfront telling and then we had activities later yeah. in that module but again it was five to seven minutes so we didn't worry too much that we told them stuff for two minutes and then yeah and i mean with stuff like that it, w the thing that struck out that stuck out to me was that you really quickly grounded it in their world right mm -hmm. away i think mm -hmm. people have a lot more patience for content coming at them if it's they don't have to guess about how it relates to them and if it's like yeah. this is about you here's how it is about you and that's what, that was a really big focus of this project. They were, those, those SMEs were very, very good at knowing their audience. Oh, excellent. And helped us with that, yep. Well, we've got time for one last quick question. Um, from a, no, no, no. Uh, Carla, do you have examples of micro learning that aren't necessarily standardized in a digital way, but still can be tracked digitally by being assessed, completed by a manager coach? Well, for example, the objective is to create something from scratch uh, where you need an actual deliverable created but doesn't have a form you can be digitized um, mm -hmm. the points kind of to practice so maybe something that happens in the real world or something yeah. where you, you make it in a place not easy to track but someone else might swing yeah. by and track it it's it's a great question and and i will say that i have tried to do something like that on mm -hmm. one or two projects basically what you're doing then is like for your manager or coach, you create like a coaching guide and here's the activity you should do with them. These would be the things you're watching for. Um, if you've got really good managers, it can work. I've often gotten a bit of pushback of people being like, well, how do we know the managers are going to actually <laughs> do it? Um, which it's not the, 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 the right answer, I think, right? We should, we should hold those managers accountable to doing their yeah. job as well. Um, but yes, I do think that you can do that really well and you can then, like, for example, we were doing one recently where it was teaching, um, marketing, uh, marketing people how to like do their messaging really well. And honestly, a standard e-learning isn't the best way to do that. Actually individualized coaching, you write a, your messaging and you send it over to someone for review and they've got a little rubric of like the four things they should look for. And you can self-assess on the same rubric, whichever. Yeah. But that's actually way more powerful. Um, but you have to know that you can count on those managers to do their their job in that regard. Yeah, and I feel like I've seen some coaching tools out that there are, that are very much from the perspective of something's being done in the real world. The the tool itself is for a manager or a coach to track up someone else's progress and give them, and often sometimes give yeah. them feedback. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point. There are tools like that. It's, it's kind of like the equivalent of an LMS for coaches, right? Yeah, exactly. To track when people are doing things and, and how well they do and where they left off and stuff like that. Well, so on that note, we've reached the top of the hour. So thank you so much for being here, Carla. This was a fantastic conversation, did a really awesome job of 
going even deeper into micro learning. Sure. Um, for those of you who might be wondering, we did record today's conversation. It's going to go up on the Learning Guild's uh, YouTube channel uh, probably Monday or Tuesday. If you want to revisit this or share it with someone else or go double check for something we talked about. Uh, but a big thank you to Carla today. Thank you to everyone sh who showed up. And a huge thanks to Mark Britz, who is making sure everything functioned really well in the back end. And thank you to everybody. You know, you were here for the, like a whole hour. Um, this, this was really awesome. I appreciate the, the great questions that came in and the conversation we were able to have. And thank you, especially Mark and Bianca for, for being here and for eLearning Guild for this great idea. I think this is an awesome um, activity. So thank you. Yeah, and for those of you who had a good time today, we've got um, our last speaker chat of the series coming up uh, two weeks today on June 12th, and that'll be uh, Nick Floro talking about tools that can help make learning really stick. So I think it would be a nice segue from talking about micro learning. So thanks for being with us today, Carla. Thanks all of you for being here and hope to see you all here in two weeks. Awesome. Bye-bye. Have a really good weekend.